Hey guys. There's the timer. Okay. And uh, it's good to be here. Um, just trying to take it all in here and see who all is here. I see there's a lot of kind of veterans like me, you know, who've been around for a little while. Um, you know, I turned, uh, well, I don't know if I said I'm Mark. I'm an alcoholic. I'm Mark. Mark. Hey, guys. Um, I just turned 60 years old in January. And, um, you know, 60 was kind of a... Kind of a big one you know 50 was cool 60 not so much you know <laughs> you know your uh, your thought process and outlook on life kind of changes a little bit um in terms of your uh you know you're a little bit more aware of your mortality not only in in terms of maybe appreciating moments more but also in terms of uh, how you treat yourself, you treat your body, how you have treated your body. And so um, these are thoughts that are, you know, kind of circling in my head. I've seen you before. I think I know you. Um, <clears throat> in any case, um, so what happened to me was, and, you know, my story, like all of our stories, it's a, it's, it's a long story. Um, I have suffered from this disease all my life and it took me a long time to realize that I have a disease and I really like to break it down into the two, the hyphenated version, dis-ease. Uh, ever since I can remember, I felt at dis-ease with myself, I felt at odds with myself, I felt uncomfortable in my being and the hardest part for me was that I always blamed myself you know and I know there's there's some of us and that's why I think you know for some people the fourth step is is really important that pointed the finger at others and then actually seeing that the fault lay more with them possibly for me, it was always the, the total opposite. I always blamed myself for thinking the thoughts that I had. I was born into, uh, you know, like a lot of us, born into a, a scenario that for a child was not, not a good scenario. Uh, my dad is still an alcoholic at 88 years old. He will, last time I visited him, and I've only seen him maybe 10 times in my life, um, if that, he will still get on his walker, and he's a, a secret, a closet drinker, at least when I'm there. Um, he will get on his walker and wheel himself into the garage and, and then progressively come out more and more uh, drunk. And... Um, he was a very uh, abusive man, mainly to my mother and to my brother. Um, my brother eventually died from uh, the effects of that abuse. My brother uh, died an alcoholic addict uh, alone in his apartment. Um, his body just gave out, you know. And <coughs> to me, that was really... Uh, um, I very much, I don't resent my father for it, I don't, um, but I do know that, that the effects of abuse uh, can, can kill, and that's what they did to my brother. I was luckier, I was, uh, I came along six years after my brother, my dad was maybe a little bit more mature, but the abuse fell squarely on my mom and my brother, and I... Um, what I didn't witness consciously, I'm sure I absorbed subconsciously. Um, anyway, I do believe that a lot of um, uh, dis-ease or disease can be rooted in childhood trauma. I definitely know that that was the case for me because it caused that discomfort, that being at odds with myself, that... Um, uh, doubting myself, hating myself, uh, 
um, part of my dis-ease, alcoholism is a symptom of our dis-ease. At least it was for me. I had many symptoms. I had, um, you know, I drank, I smoked a lot of hash, uh, you know, and it wasn't for me in the beginning with, uh, with substance, substances. It wasn't like, man, I feel great. This is all I want to do for the rest of my life. It was something that I did simply because it distracted me from me, you know, no matter how it made me feel, at least I didn't feel like me because I didn't very much like me. You know, I was very uncomfortable in me. And um, there were numerous symptoms, you know, there was depression, there was suicide, there was anorexia, there was uh, uh, social phobia. I could not go out in public for a long time because I, <coughs> my knees would shake, my mouth would shake. It was, and again, the worst two things were really hard. Number one is that I didn't know what the hell was going on with me. And number two was that I blamed myself. And I honestly don't know, well, I almost did not survive it because the suicide attempts were very serious. It wasn't so much that I wanted to die. I just didn't know how to live. I had no idea how to live. And, um, so somehow I soldiered on. I grew up in Germany. I was a military brat. My dad was uh, in the military. So I grew up in Germany where, you know, we were in the bars at like 14 years old, you know, as long as your voice had already cracked, then uh, you were free to go, you know. And, and uh, so I was in the bars with my buddies that, you know, started out like, yeah, it's on the week, just on the weekends. We're going to go out on the weekend. And then, oh, well, you know, and then it progressed to daily use. <coughs> drinking beer, smoking hash, you know, that was uh, eventually became a daily thing. And then my, my depression started kicking in because of my, my, um, what I believe was my trauma. And, um, you know, and this just went kind of, I mean, who could help me, especially in Germany, the awareness toward those kind of things was, uh, not what it is here necessarily. So, um, so I had to pull a geographical. I eventually had to leave Germany. I was in, I ended up joining a rock band because I'm, uh, I like music. I was in a rock band and I was, uh, they say that one person out of four in a rock band is the disaster. Well, that was me. And I always tell the other guys, well, I took the hit for you guys. So, you know, so, you know, yeah, I took the hit, but I had to leave an entire country that I didn't necessarily want to leave. I lived in Berlin, Germany, which was a very cool, you know, culturally thriving music art you know, all night bars. Uh, it was great. I loved it. And I didn't want to leave, but I eventually wasn't going to work. I couldn't take care of myself. Um, and so I, I came to the U.S. I lived in, in Delaware for a couple of years with my mom, had relocated, remarried. And I lived in the state of Delaware, which after Berlin, Germany was just kind of like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, and, um, but anyway, I toughed it out and, uh, I coincidentally had some friends that I knew from Berlin that had moved to Seattle and um, the Seattle music scene uh, back in the early 90s was really thriving and I had a, I was already listening to the Seattle music stuff in, in Berlin and, and so I, uh, it was on my radar. So my friend said, hey, come on out, check it out. Uh, you can, if you decide you want to move here, you can stay with us. And they had a nice house on Queen Anne Hill. So. Eventually, after visiting here three times, I came with my couple of guitars, took the Amtrak Empire Builder three days. It was a great train ride out to Seattle. And um, but again, no matter where you go, there you are, you know, and I had a counselor in Delaware at the time. And he said, don't don't leave. I, I'm afraid you're going to you're going to you're going to die out there. And I was very surprised that he would say that. But we had started a counseling process that I had. Um, had to leave because I felt so uncomfortable in Delaware. And um, anyway, so I came to Seattle and I lived with my friends for three months and then I got my own place. And, um, and for an alcoholic, living alone is not always a good idea. 
In fact, one of the topics at the meeting that I chair, which I'm so grateful for Sean that he'd asked me to take over for him. I, you know, I've been to, I've been to meet a lot of meetings over the years and, uh, um, and I, and, and I've also done a lot of soul searching and, and I'm, I'm just kind of a seeker. I'm a thinker. And so I think about topics cause I'm a bus driver. I drive the Metro buses. I drive in circles, you know, like I like to say, like a monkey every day, you know, I'm driving in circles and, uh, and I get a lot of time to think. And so I think of things that are, have been pertinent to my, my recovery, you know, to my soul searching process, to what the things are that made me think what I think and make me do what I do. And one of them, one of the topics was the lonely place. And um, because that's a very real place for all of us we all at some point or another find ourselves in the lonely place. And that can be on a bar stool in a bar as well, or it can be in an apartment alone. You're, um, and it's because this inability to reach out. And that's the one thing that Bill W realized. And I love that movie, Bill W. My name is Bill W because there's that, there's a few scenes in there, but the, there's the crucial scene the essence of the AA scene, what it's all about. Bill is standing in the hotel lobby and on the left, he sees the bar and you can feel that pull. We've all felt that pull to like, and he'd only had like six months sober and, and the pull was so strong because he was struggling, but he knew, he knew he followed it through in his head. You can see he was following it through. He knew what was going to happen. It was going to be disappointing his wife. It was going to be who knows how many months of, of promises made, not kept, you know, uh, and he knew he had to take action and this is an action program. It's the only thing that will get us out of the lonely place is action. And, um, he decides to go into the bar, but he asks for court, uh, nickels, nickels it was. And he goes to the directory in the lobby, the church directory, and he calls <coughs> all these churches and his quest is to talk to another alcoholic. Now, why would he want to talk to another alcoholic? And, <coughs> and I, I remember when I moved to Delaware, I felt so bad, so low about myself that I knew I had to be in a place where there were people who probably felt as badly about themselves <coughs> as I did. And my stepdad is at the time was on the board of a place called the Sunday breakfast mission, which was a homeless shelter for men. And I asked him uh, if I could volunteer there. And he said, yeah, I could. And so I went to volunteer at the Sunday breakfast mission. And my point being, I had to be, with people who felt as badly about themselves as I did, because in the end, healing comes to identification. That's why we tell the newcomer, um, stick around till you hear something that you can identify with. You know, it's about relating and, um, about seeing your story, hearing your story. You know, when we start relating to others, we feel less, alienated and isolated. And you know, I'm not the big, I'm not the most social person. I have a certain tolerance for being social, but what I do know is that, that I need to connect with other people who share the same brain that I have. The brain that tells me that I'm, you know, I'm worthless, you know, that doubts itself, that, that loads itself. And I know that everybody in this room in one way or another has struggled with themselves that way so much so that they thought the only way to get away from that was to take a drink or a drug just to have that relief. And, um, and I think that's what Bill Wilson realized that he needed to be with somebody who was exactly like him. 
And it's so beautiful when he meets Dr. Bob and Dr. Bob says, well, it's all well and good. I, I, but, but, but what, how do you think you can help me? And Bill says, I didn't come here to help you. I, I came here to help myself. And that's the reciprocal process of this, of recovery is by <clears throat> helping yourself, you're also helping another person. And, um, and then another, oh, geez. Oh, we're done, huh? Yeah. Oh my God. Anyway, um, uh, I just want to make uh, okay. one more point. Oh, okay. This is the last point that I have to make. Um, the last topic or the next topic is going to be chasing the new high. And I was talking to a, a newcomer at the meeting the other night and I said, and I could tell he wasn't the kind of newcomer that was like, get my slip sign and I'm the hell out of here. He was somebody who was hungry. He was hungry for something. He was ready to receive something. And I said, you know, I said, you know, that, that elation or that good feeling you have after a conversation with somebody when you might've felt kind of bad beforehand, but afterward you just feel better. And he said, yeah. And I said, that's the new high. That's the new high that you have to chase. The old high can kill you. It's going to bring nothing but, but hardship and heartbreak for you and others. But this new high is going to be constructive. It's going to be progressive. So that's the new high that I have to chase every day. And so do we all. So anyway, thanks for listening. I'm Mark. I'm an alcoholic. Oh, my, my, my.